So today we are going to be talking about the Zimbardo prison experiment, and we are going to be focusing more on the takeaways, but to talk about the experiment a little bit, um, it's one of the most infamous experiments in uh, psychology in the United States, uh, probably top two, this one and the Milgram experiment, which I think we'll cover later. Um, in this experiment, what happened is they put out a notice, which is what this picture is right here, uh, inviting college students to uh, enter in a mock prison experiment and they wanted to say see what would happen if you put people in a mock prison environment how would they change how would they react stuff like this okay and these uh it happened in the early 70s and coming off of like world war ii and like the atrocities committed by the nazis a lot of experiments in psychology they were trying to kind of get at like how could people turn so bad how could people turn so evil and a good experiment or like a good example of this was the SF's uh, prison people, and so this seems like a fine experiment for Philip Zimbardo, who grew up, you know, in a time that's post-World War II, and really focused on this stuff. So, they round up all of the, the, the people who are going to be in the experiment, and they actually arrest them with actual police officers, and they're trying to grit this immersive effect. They book them in a real police station. Um, I think that this is, I can't remember the name of the station, I think Palo Alto Police Station, but they book them, and then they will eventually take them to, see this is the booking, they take them to this prison that they built in the basement of Stanford University, okay, and they have the individual cells for them, and then they have the guards, and this is one mistake that Zimbardo made, is he made himself warden of the prison in the experiment. And this is something experimenters try and avoid a lot now. Um, not just Philip Zimbardo's like prison experiment, but um, trying to keep themselves as out of the experiment as possible. Because what they were testing for, and I think I said this in the intro, is like they were testing to see if roles would shape the way uh, people were, or how quickly like a prison environment could devolve. And if he puts himself in the place of the warden, one of the problems is now he's immersing himself in the very thing he means to study. And so he's no longer like a dispassionate uh, observer. Instead, he is creating this us versus them sort of um, thing going on with uh, the people who are being imprisoned, who are, mind you, have committed no crimes. Uh, this is important to emphasize. They are completely free of guilt. Um, they just decided to enroll in this experiment. Okay. And so... They have this all set up, and this is, uh, so at one point, here, let's go to the next one. So what ends up happening is the guards uh, end up growing increasingly sadistic. I think it's, the experiment takes place, it was supposed to take place for a couple weeks, but then they stop it after like a weekend or like a week. I forget exactly how short they stop it, but the problem was the guards were becoming increasingly sadistic and cruel to the prisoners. And this is important to emphasize. They like know that they're other students. They're just other students that are part of Stanford who have enrolled in the experiment. And it's just a flip of the coin as to whether they were appointed a guard or a prisoner. Um, one instance of this is the previous image where they are strip searching a person. Um, okay. And then let's see some sleeping prisoners here. And so this is where the guards turn fire extinguisher on the prisoners who are getting, like, out of line. One thing is that it became a sort of power trip for a lot of the guards in that they are trying to get, like, very precise and exact compliance. And when they don't get it, they punish and or are cruel to the prisoners. And so, you know, they're not treating them as human beings. It's very dehumanizing. Um... Another thing that they did is they, as punishment, removed the mattresses. Um, they put prison into solitary confinement. Uh, and at one point, I'm not sure if this picture corresponds to it, they, have, they get all the other prisoners to chant, XYZ prisoner did a bad thing. They also strip the prisoners of their names, really, and refer to them only by their numbers. Um, we have being taken with the blindfold and the guards. And then later, and this is probably where you start to notice Philip Zimbardo is in too deep, is they have the family's visit, and Zimbardo says to himself, hmm, well, we don't want to see them to see how bad it is. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the families wait too long, and then we're going to have them sit at a dinner, and we're going to serve them a long dinner, 
or a very nice dinner to the, the inmates and the families. And so what the goal of this entire procedure was, was to sort of um, make it so that the families felt uncomfortable because they had to wait a long time. And then they saw how the types of meals that the prisoners seemed to be getting. And they're like, oh, this isn't so bad. And so when the prisoners complain, the families are like, ah, oh, you're fine. You know, this seems all right. And so the prisoners were like kind of cowed into silence a little bit more. But this is an example of he is no longer a dispassionate observer. He is shaping events. This is them eating the meal. And this is them visiting with the prisoners. Like, this is Philip Zimbardo himself uh, on the far right. Um, and this is him as in his place as like prison warden. Eventually, Zimbardo, uh, it do he actually isn't the one who manages to break the spell on himself in terms of occupying this role. Uh, it's actually his girlfriend who's like, dude, what the hell are you doing? You're like being an absolute psychopath. And then he's like, wow, I'm being an absolute psychopath. So he stops the experiment. Um, this is a debriefing of the experiment. In interviews later, and when they followed up with a, a lot of these people, um, particularly like the prisoners, they described this as like one of the most traumatic things of their life. And this is, this is like really powerful in the sense that when you're looking at it, um, there's one of the guards smiling all happy like. When you're looking at it, uh, there is this, um, it's easy to forget that they're in roles and be like, oh, there's a prisoner and a guard. And you just like, the people behind that just kind of get erased and it's just a prisoner and a guard. And you have to like, remember that in this experiment, they're all just students who signed up for a study. And just the conditions of having this person who has a power relationship where they're trying to elicit compliance and kind of stamp down the uh, prisoner. And the prisoner is like uh, part of their identity is like in being subversive to like a guard being an a-hole. Uh, this happens and this degradation happened where like uh, people were just being grossly mistreated uh, in an environment where no one had done anything wrong. And if you like extrapolate, it's easy to see how things can get out of hand when there are actually like um, people who are in prison for actually doing stuff wrong because you don't, you don't have like the pause, oh, like maybe they didn't do anything wrong, like this sort of thing. And so it's e it would be even easier to get lost in the sauce, as it were, uh, if you are actually like a prison guard and you are actually watching prisoners. Um, another thing that, like, this kind of makes me think of is the Abu Ghraib, Garib, I forget how it's pronounced, the prison scandal where in Iraq, it might have been Iran, I think it was Iraq, United States soldiers were torturing prisoners effectively and humiliating them, and it's like, oh man, not us. And then it's, if you dehumanize the other, uh, it kind of justifies treating them, like, terribly. And this happens a lot in prison. And so what I think the big takeaway from this study is, is how easy it is for us to get lost in identities and roles that we have been placed upon ourselves and how that informs our behavior in a way that um, can come to like horrify ourselves. In the case of Philip Zimbardo, he has actually, you know, went on to write and speak so much on how much he has regretted um, the experiment in terms of the way he inserted himself into it as the warden and gave himself a role as the warden because of how awful it made him and it made him you know carry out these uh, relatively horrific things against innocent students like obviously they weren't like beating them but they were doing everything short of like physical uh brutality in order to you know just make their lives worse like messing with their sleep and stuff like this um and this is, if he had not thought of himself as the warden specifically, and instead assigned himself the role of dispassionate experimenter, I think I can just enlarge my face here at this point, uh, then things would have been a lot different, you know? But 
Instead, he has this role that is, like, informing his action. And this isn't just, like, a cautionary tale, but it's also, if you want to get something done or do something productive, there is this thing where you should also pay attention to roles. Because the role that you consider yourself to occupy, and perhaps this is a, a bit of a, a topic for another discussion, but if you are trying to, like, let's say, become better as, like, more in shape, or, like, work on your fitness, if you think of yourself as an athlete, you will likely be able to do more and push yourself more than if you think of yourself as, like, a couch potato, right? The role in which you assign yourself is going to infer the actions you find available to yourself. So if you think about it like this, and this is kind of like a bit of an extended free will discussion, you don't really contr control what thoughts pop up in your head, right? You just, the thoughts pop into your head and then you pay attention to them and they're just there. And you can't choose to think of something that you were not already thinking of, right? This is uh, a kind of like a weird like paradox of sorts, but okay. Well then what controls what enters our mind? And then a lot of that is conditioning and a lot of that is context. Part of context, right? Like if you're in an airport, you see airport stuff and you think about airport things. If you're in a deli, you see deli stuff and you think of deli things. If you're driving past the KFC, you're more likely to crave the KFC. You know, there's a lot of studies that show that like, uh, if your drive home is past like, or not a lot of studies, I think there was one study that showed if your drive home is past fast food, you're like more likely to be fat, something like this. Um, you know, context affects what things pop into your head which then affects what actions you have available. Part of context includes the roles and relationships you have related to other people around you or your environment, right? If you think of yourself, and in particular, I noticed this a lot when I was a bouncer at a nightclub. If you are thinking of yourself as a bouncer in a nightclub, you see the nightclub environment way differently than if you are attending there like for fun. And it is part of the role that informs that, right? You see the environment differently. It affords you or it gives you different what's called affordances. So um, if you think of a bartender, when a bartender sees the back of a bar, they see not only just like all these alcohols, but they see all this stuff they could mix drink, uh, the, all the drinks they could mix, all the various, you know, actions they can take behind the bar that's informed by their skill, not just their identity, because they also have like a skill behind it. Um, affordances are a way in which you perceive reality through a lens of what you can do with that reality. If you see yourself as a guard, right, coming back to full circle to the Zimbardo prison experiment, then the way that, the way you're going to have different affordances in terms of how you can treat the prisoners. So you're, you're thinking of yourself through this lens of I'm a guard and they're a prisoner. And so what that means for you is you see through the lens of I must elicit compliance and also these people are beneath me and you don't, it ceases to become a human to human interaction. Instead, it's this role to role guard to prisoner interaction, you know, because it's when they started the experiment, I'm sure it was very plausible that they thought that they were just all going to basically hang out. And some of them would happen to be guards and some of them would happen to be prisoners and it would just be a stupid psycholo psychology experiment and, you know, like, no one would take it seriously. But people took it seriously and they occupied their roles. And this happens, like, more in life. And it's... If our roles pay, make this big a difference, obviously this is a case study, but it's pretty easy to see... It's pretty easy to find other examples in life of people just, like... Um, either going way too far or going like excellently with their role. Uh, if roles make such a big difference, then we should be consciously choosing our roles or at least consciously thinking about what roles we have and how that might affect what we do. You know, if we think of ourselves in a particular way, we are going to create a lens by which we experience how we can interact with the world. And it is better to consciously think that through than it is to just 
willy-nilly kind of let it let it be assigned to us by society and so we could like challenge roles as well you know this is how to do that and how to work on that is probably a bit of a discussion for another time but what i think is really important about the zimbardo prison experiment why don't we go back through a lot of these is that it illustrates just the sheer power of it all because this is not a uh, look if you told me that prisoners were tortured in like a time of war and mistreated and but it's like it seems like a very us versus that dynamic it like that's not as jaw-dropping to me as seeing all of these people being mistreated you know in a time of peace when they are all like in the same side and how there's just this process of like immersing them in this fake environment that they know on its face is fake will cause them to occupy the roles it's just it's just uh it is mind-boggling how like powerful this is in a very subtle way because they don't think that their control is being seized from them by their role it's not an insidious like it grabs your brain type of thing it is a subtle thing where just what appears to you like which isn't your choice just the thoughts that come into your head are informed and shaped through this lens of your role and you don't actually look at the lens or m most people don't actually look at the lens of their role itself they just merely see through it and aren't seeing how this affects what they can do how they perceive reality and how this is going to make them this picture is of the one who is known as John Wayne uh, and he was the most sadistic of the guards and back to the talking about roles it's uh, I wish I could like say something for emphasis that's like a uh, difficult to do but it's because I think I'm already emphasizing uh, this experiment is also very interesting if you wanted to check it out more I think there's a bunch of free videos of it on YouTube um, and there's tons of videos of Zimbardo talking about uh, this sort of thing uh, it's kind of the defining experiment of his uh, career definitely because it's like one of the two biggest uh, experiments in psychology and you know the I think the most majority of people have never sat down and wrote I am and then filled it through like 10 times with all the roles that they feel they occupy or 10 roles that they feel they occupy and this is something you could do and then once you write I am blank role like a teacher uh you know a student a philosopher uh an athlete like these types of things and then write question myself how that might this change my experience of reality how that might this inform what options i see are as available to myself is this empowering is this disempowering you know just like do like a sort of rudimentary like brainstorm analysis of the roles that we perceive ourselves to occupy we might find that some roles do not serve us very well and some roles we could shift to do a little bit better and i think a really good example of this is that um if you read the i think it's the president's report on 21st century policing was released in like 2017 something like this there is a distinction that gets made for improving policing and that is this a lot of police officers view themselves as warriors this leads to an adversarial type of dynamic between them and the people that they are policing it would be preferable if uh things were implemented to make them see themselves not as warriors but as guardians and to see themselves as guardians of the group that they are policing such that there is not as adversarial a relationship and you do not have these adversarial things coming out of their roles and i think this is both particularly striking and particularly timely it's striking because it seems like just this very very small uh shift but both the description of the warrior really well describes a lot of problems with policing that I've seen today. And the description of guardian re really fits with how police officers ought to be seeing themselves. 
and ideally you should see, see themselves. I don't think there's anyone who thinks that police officers would are better off thinking of themselves as warriors than guardians, unless they think particular groups are problematic. But that's like another, that's another video, right? But the point is, is that this simple reframe, if you look at the Zimbardo experiment and you see just how big a difference that it made, you know, when it came to the roles informing how people were, and then you think about this reframe just on policing, it's like, wow, this is like a big thing. And so that's an example of how reframing can be used in order to, you know, change outcomes. And again, we're like taking off these glasses of the role and we're looking at the glasses themselves and saying, do these serve us and our goals and our values? And if they don't, we should change them. And so when you take off the lenses of like police officer, warrior, or is, should it be guardian, and you make the shift. We can do the same thing ourselves by like looking at how we see ourselves, looking at the roles, and then saying, does this serve this? Does it not serve us? You know, you could come up with 10 questions you think are good for roles. You know, does it serve us? One, uh, is this empowering? Is this consistent with my values? What might this make me pay attention to? What might make this me fail to notice? You know, how might this affect my relationships? Um, is this something that is helpful to those around me? Like these sorts of questions and just make a list, you know? And because to some extent that's what's done in the 21st century policing suggestion is how do we get uh, police officers to not see themselves as adversarial uh, with the people that they are policing? And the answer is, you, you shift from warrior to guardian. Um, so I think I'm getting to the point where I might start rambling if I continue any longer. I think it is really important to think in terms of roles and that this study is really good at um, illustrating it. It's a, obviously this is a case study, right? And it's also not numerical. And so to some extent the data like, you know, it's possible that John Wayne, the particularly bad one, was a driver of a lot of the bad effects that happened at the Zimbardo prison experiment. I don't think that's the case, but you could attack that ex in the on the experimental basis. But I think the really big takeaway is thinking of the roles in which we occupy, because they are they are like basically in terms of the way in which they are filtering reality for us. That filter itself is invisible to us. We just see through the filter, and if we take a step back and look at the filter, this can allow us to just find huge holes or opportunities in terms of how we are looking at ourselves in reality. Anyways, if you like this, uh, feel free to give it a like, uh, comment, subscribe, all the YouTube stuff. You know, um, if you have any suggestions or thoughts or disagreements, um, feel free to put them down in the comments below, especially if you... Um, I mean, I've read a lot of books that are kind of similar to this topic, but any sort of literature that's like in this vein, I would be interested to hear about. And um, other than that, have a good one.